Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. We've come now to day 260 and Deuteronomy chapter 14. Yesterday we were talking about idolatry and I mentioned the quote from Calvin, a man's nature is a perpetual factory of idols. I've got that coffee cup today. Man's nature is a perpetual factory of idols. It's a very dark Calvin against a dark background, but uh, good coffee, dark roast. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word and for this opportunity to spend time in your word. Please teach us your word. Write it on our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Deuteronomy 14. You are the sons of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves or make any baldness on your foreheads for the dead. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. You shall not eat any abomination. There are These are the animals you may eat. The ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roebuck the wild goat, the ibex, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. Every animal that parts the hoof and has the hoof cloven in two and chews the cud among the animals you may eat. Yet of those that chew the cud or have the hoof cloven, you shall not eat these, the camel, the hare, and the rock badger, because they chew the cud but do not part the hoof, are unclean to you. And the pig, because it parts the hoof but does not chew the cud, is unclean for you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. Of all that are in the waters you may eat these, whatever has fins and scales you may eat, and whatever does not have fins and scales you shall not eat, it is unclean for you. You may eat all clean birds, but these are the ones that you shall not eat, the eagle, the bearded vulture, the black vulture, the kite, the falcon of any kind, every raven of any kind, the ostrich, the night hawk, the seagull, the hawk of any kind, the little owl and the short-eared owl, the barn owl and the tawny owl, the carrion vulture and the cormorant, the stark, the stork, (laughs) the heron of any kind, the hoopoe and the bat. And all winged insects are unclean for you. They shall not be eaten all clean winged things you may eat. You shall not eat anything that has died naturally. You may give it to the sojourner who is within your gates or within your towns that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. You shall not. You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. And before the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose to make his name dwell, there you shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, of your, and of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And if the way is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe, When the Lord your God blesses you because the place is too far from you, which the Lord your God chooses to set his name there, then you shall turn it into money and bind up the money in your hand and go to the place that the Lord your God chooses and spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves, and you shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household, and you shall not neglect the Levite who is within your towns, for he has no portion or inheritance with you. At the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. That is Deuteronomy chapter 14. So a lot of people have questions about these dietary laws. You know, do we do we observe the dietary laws, right? This is, uh, some people wonder about this. Well, it's actually very clear 
in the New Testament that we do not anymore keep the dietary laws. In fact, of all the things that are clearly said in the New Testament, this one is probably one of the most clear. Jesus says first in the Gospels that what goes into a man does not make him unclean, but rather what comes out of a man, thus declaring all foods clean. That's in Mark chapter 7. But he says it's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, but it's what comes out of a man, out of the heart, uh, come forth all the cursings and, and blasphemies, and those things make a man unclean. And then in Acts chapter 10, when God calls Peter to go and share the gospel with Cornelius and all of his household, he shows him a, a sheet laid down from heaven with all kinds of animals on it, all kinds of animals. And he says to Peter, arise, kill and eat. And Peter says, I've never eaten an unclean thing in my life. And God says, what I have called clean, do not call common or do not call unclean what I've called clean. And three times God shows him that vision. Now, the message there was you can go to Cornelius' house, you can go into his house, presumably eat whatever's put in front of you, even though he's a Gentile, because what God has called clean, do not call unclean. And Jesus had already declared in his earthly ministry that it's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, but what comes out, so all foods are clean. And then in Acts 15, the church is wrestling with, what do we do with these Gentiles who have come to the Lord? Through Peter's ministry in particular, a number of Gentiles have come to know the Lord. What do we do with them? <clears throat> well, the decision is made not to put any of the dietary laws or any of the festivals and feast days or any of that ceremonial aspect of the law on those people, but just to tell them, abstain from sexual morality, from food sacrifice to idols, and don't eat, don't drink blood, don't eat meat that still has blood in it. So, um, that's important. And he's not talking there about a rare steak or a medium rare steak. He's not talking about that. He's talking about um, animals that were killed in such a way that the blood wasn't drained out of them. And so the, the, the meat is literally like blood saturated. And that was a, that was a decision of the Jerusalem council uh, to, to have peace within the church. But it's clear that the dietary laws were not uh, applied. Uh, and then you just have repeated references in Romans, uh, in 1 Corinthians, that people are free to eat whatever they want to eat. Uh, diet is not what the kingdom of God is about anymore. There's another misconception, though. Even people who say, okay, the dietary laws are not binding anymore, but this is a healthy way to eat because, you know, God gave his people this diet because it was a healthier diet, and therefore, you know, you, you should eat this way anyway, even though it's not required. You should eat this way because it's healthier. There's nothing in this passage about this being healthy. That is not the point of God giving this diet. God wasn't saying these animals are healthy to eat and these animals are unhealthy to eat. You can make that argument in a couple of places, but rabbits are not unhealthy to eat, right? Um, if cooked properly, you know, lots of things are, are healthy to eat that are on the forbidden list. And, you know, people say, well, you know, it was hard to cook it properly. Well, that's just not, that's not what God says the purpose is. The purpose is to mark his people out as being holy, being distinct, being set apart. In fact, one of the things you'd have to struggle with if you think that God's primary purpose here was health, in verse 21, he says, don't eat anything that's died naturally, but you can give it to the to the sojourner within your gates, or you can sell it to a foreigner. But you're a people holy to the Lord your God. If the issue is health here, God's already told them earlier in the law of Moses that they are to treat the sojourner and the foreigner the way they would want to be treated, that they're to be equal justice under the law, equal treatment. So why would you give something that you know is unhealthy to a foreigner? That doesn't. That's not loving. That's not treating them well. So it's not the case that you know, if this animal died naturally, that therefore it's unhealthy. I mean, people had sense to know when an animal died of a disease and it was a diseased meat versus something that is still perfectly healthy to eat. But the issue wasn't that. The issue is holiness. The holiness of God 
God is set apart. God is in a category by himself. He is, in fact, he alone is triply holy. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah sees this vision and, and the four living creatures around the throne say, holy, holy, holy. He is triply holy. In a category by himself, set apart, unique. He's separate from sin. He's separate from defilement, but he's also in a category unto himself. We are his holy people. We are set apart. Now, what marks us in the new covenant age as being his holy people is not our diet or our clothing. Except in issues of modesty, you could make a case there. But it's our speech and our conduct. We are to be holy in our speech and in our behavior. We do strange things like get up on Sunday morning and go worship God together with his people. We do strange things like take the first 10% of our income and give it to God as a tithe. We do strange things like serve others and be kind to others and treat others the way we would want to be treated. We don't use our tongues to curse people made in the image of God because we bless God with our tongue. We should bless others who are made in his image. That's the kind of holiness, a set apart and distinct manner of speech and behavior that makes us different from the world around us. So, no, we don't keep the dietary laws. And in terms of these tithes, of these different kinds of, of things that we do, um, this is uh, most of this is part of the ceremonial law in terms of these special kinds of tithes. But there still is a principle that predates the law of Moses that goes back to early parts of Genesis with Abraham and Melchizedek and, and, and Jacob's vow that he makes to the Lord so early Genesis, before the law of Moses, there's still a principle that if you belong to God as his holy people, you do worship him. And part of how you worship him is by giving him the tenth, the tithe, the first tenth, uh, first fruits, firstborn. Uh, and so that, that principle is an abiding principle. It's not particular to the ceremonial aspects of the Mosaic law. So we are to be God's holy people. Uh, we are to worship him and honor him with all of our lives because he has redeemed us and we are his. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love and for your word and for the perfect way in which you reveal yourself to us and you give yourself to us. Help us to be holy, even as you are holy. Help us to live lives that are set apart for your glory, for you are worthy of everything we have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, tomorrow we start 1 Corinthians in our uh, morning devotional. So I hope you can join us for that. Day 261 tomorrow takes us to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Have a blessed day in the Lord. Mm -hmm.